Hello and welcome to the conversation. I'm Heil Russell. I'm Josh Wallen. And Heil, have you ever been close to tragedy or been close to folks who have? Have you ever felt a pain so powerful, so heavy you collapse? I'm a, I, I'm a Donkey Kong journalist, so yes. <laughs> That's a that's a ska reference for you ska heads in the audience. Ska, ska. We we will be talking a little bit about that musical genre tonight. And I say tonight, but it's actually morning. It's midnight local time, Josh. And what mm-hmm. special occasion could inspire us to dust ourselves off and begin recording? An episode of DK Vine's The Conversation, so damned late. Well, it has to be an event so holy, so religiously tinged, that what we're having is, in effect, a midnight mass. Why, it's an event- That's right, I woke up at 7.30pm, that's the event. Well- I'm 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 trying to cover for you, Josh. I'm trying to <laughs> trying to cover for oh, your. Oh, so sorry, sorry. Thank you. Carry on. Yes, Heil. What is the event? Your your odd schedule notwithstanding, there's but one event <laughs> that could inspire us to convene as Monday night becomes Tuesday morning, as the clock strives twelve, the bewitching hour. It can only be. The 20th anniversary of a Donkey Kong Country game. But wait, how does that math work? We just talked about the 20th anniversary of the Game Boy Advance remake for Donkey Kong Country earlier this year. Donkey Kong Country 2's Game Boy Advance remake, that didn't come out until 2004, and Donkey Kong Country Returns, well, that, that 20th anniversary won't be for another seven years. What could I possibly be referring to? Well, Josh, well, everyone listening in the live stream, what I'm referring to, it's a bit of a secret. It's a secret Donkey Kong Country game that only the elite know about. You know how rich people have private islands that they fly to uh, that only they know about, and it's kind of their escape. It's it's like uh, like Jeffrey Epstein, notwithstanding. Yeah, it's it's something rich people do, right? Like they they have these secret Uh, islands. I have seen Glass Onion. Yes, I know this. (laughs) The, the The elite of the world. The, the jet setters. Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, Kenny Omega, Hangman Page. <laughs> they, they fly. <laughs> they love Barrel Maze, man. They play it all the time. They love Cracker Barrel. The, the elite Donkey Kong fandom, Josh. We have oh, our own secret okay. retreat. It's a secret Donkey Kong Country game that was released in late 2003. Now, late 2003. Let me tell you what, DK Vine, as an institution, we were struggling to keep up in late 2003, which, as you all know, was the first full year of the buyout era. And whether Mm -hmm. we liked it or not, and we didn't, things were rapidly changing from how the video game landscape looked in the 1990s, when we were little babies... And how it looked then. Rare, of course, was owned by Microsoft. Nintendo was going to be developing Donkey Kong games both internally and with new studios. Grabbed by the Ghoulies had recently come out to middling reviews, low sales, but an enthusiastic reception by us. Mario <laughs> Mario yeah. Kart Double Dash had also just been released, enrapturing some Ugh. and breaking others' hearts. And I think Josh just See, revealed y- where y- you you make that comparison, and I'm just like, I had bought a GameCube uh-huh. before the buyout happened. I had bought it primarily for a, for a couple of reasons, but one of the biggest was Rare Games. So yeah, just thinking, I remember that fall. 
are late this time 20 years ago playing Mario Kart Double Dash and just being and just seeing the DK Fine community having a wonder having a wonderful time having a way better time than than anyone else seemed to be with Ghoulies and just being like god I wish that were me <laughs> well some people like Double Dash as we just discussed here on the conversation what? a couple of episodes back <laughs> <laughs> oh, Heil. No, they don't. That was a four-hour spotlight episode. We'll see if we reach that mark on this one. <laughs> Good luck. Speaking of Double Dash, Diddy Kong now had ten fingers and ten toes. And we had learned about an entirely new adventure that happened to Banjo and Kazooie between Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. But it was set 20 years in the past at the same time. Nintendo and Sega, and, and, they were sharing the same mm, bed, Josh. Weird times. It was <laughs> weird, s- weird times. Such a confusing, baffling year. It just the ground was quaking underneath your feet. But the cherry on top of this ghastly Sunday, the thing that made us fundamentally question the nature of of what a Donkey Kong game exactly was, suddenly appeared out of the blue, out of nowhere. Now, there was zero fanfare for this. There was no warning whatsoever. We couldn't hear it coming. And if we could, (laughs) all we would hear was the incessant blare of the same ska track repeated over and over across ten levels Mm. i'm talking about the most forgotten most overlooked most confusing game to ever bear the donkey kong country branding i'm of course talking about donkey kong country barrel maze (sighs) and the midnight (sighs) seance begins (laughs) so I think to properly explain what Barrel Maze is, we have to first explain what CandyStand.com was. Oh my god. I'm just, this, I, I, I love how there's like levels of obscure, it's like, it's like one of those iceberg memes with the DKU. Where you've got like don- your Donkey Kong Country and your Banjo Kazooie up top, and then somewhere, somewhere below that, you've got like it's Mr. Pants and Saber Man, <clears throat> and then beneath even those, beneath the Rare Cow, Hello Freezer, beneath beneath the Game Boy Advance games, beneath Ryan Styles being a DKU character. There is Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, a game that, if not for DK Vine, I'm sure I never would have heard of, and I imagine the internet itself would have no memory of. This would have been a game lost to the ages. It's sort of lost at the moment, because we haven't Mm -hmm. really found a workaround to play Shockwave games in the post-Flash era, but we did preserve it. We'll get into that a little bit. Let's talk first about CandyStand.com. Now, CandyStand.com was the internet's first repository for what I believe are referred to as advert games. Games Hmm. that are, in effect, just advertisements for brands, usually food. In this case, candy. CandyStand.com was owned by Kraft Foods via their Lifesavers candy brand, and it launched on March 30th, 1997, and it would become... Man, I didn't know that. Yeah, it would become at ubiquitous in school computer labs in the late 90s, but I think especially in the early to mid-aughts. That's really mm-hmm. sort of the height of CandyStand.com. Where you could play these shockwave powered browser games that were very perfunctory, very cheap, very. Uh, I mean, I mean they, they were engaging in that they were games you could play on the computer for free 
And at ease of access, all you needed was, you know, a, a internet access, a dial-up modem even, and you could play these. So it wasn't out of the realm of accessibility for anyone who had access to a computer. And so they were popular for the time. I think they've since, of course, been displaced by mobile games and their like. And it's it's... It's very quaint, I, I would say, these games are, especially because their primary purpose was to sell junk food to children. But <laughs> CandyStand.com sort of blew up, became very popular, and Lifesavers, the the stewards of CandyStand, started licensing other properties on CandyStand.com that weren't related to craft foods. And so they started to attract some relatively large IP. So it, you can come for these cartoon characters that you might like and then subconsciously really want to suck on a lifesaver afterwards. So it was still a way to advertise to gullible children, but they got a lot more clever and crafty about it as time went on. <laughs> Now, for what, the gullible children in the audience out there right now, should we explain at all what shockwave, what Macromedia shockwave flash was in in layman's terms? I'm not even sure if I'm qualified to do that. It's beyond my. I'm definitely not, but I'll try anyway. Okay. Uh, okay. Ma- Macromedia flash was a browser plugin that basically powered animations and games on the internet. In the late 90s through, I would say, like all of the 2000s. Um, it was third-party software. It wasn't like part of the HTTP standard. But it was basically a set of... It was basically just a platform that you could build games and animations on top of. It is now depreciated and has been for some time. Uh, Macromedia... Actually, no, Adobe actually ended up owning it and and that was yeah. due primarily to like Heil said the rise of mobile gaming making a bit making it a bit redundant uh the the sort of way that it, it it was never actually compatible with mobile browsers anyway and as the internet has increasingly moved to mobile it became uh quite depreciated um but I will say I I I definitely miss it it was a standard in computer labs when when I was in school and uh throughout and again throughout the 2000s and um in memory of it, I'd just like to read a line from one of the great, albeit non-ska, poets of our time. <laughs> um, in memory of Shockwave, we download in the Shockwave for all the ladies in the cave to get your groove on. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of companies buying other companies... <laughs> Right. <laughs> CandyStand.com was eventually purchased by, of all things, Publishers Clearinghouse in 2016. <laughs> so CandyStand became PCH Games in 2016. Publishers Clearinghouse Games. And I feel like we also have to explain what Publishers Clearinghouse is. Uh, Publishers Clearinghouse is this... And I'm not really qualified to talk about this. I just remember the commercials airing during The Price is Right when I was a kid. This, like, they would send you old magazines or something, and they, you, you would, like, try to get other people to buy these old magazines, and you could win these big checks, and they would show up at your door with a video camera and say, here's $30,000 with this big check. And everybody would go, oh, my God, oh, my God. And... um they they were like, make sure you're home because Publishers Clearinghouse might be knocking on your door. And if you're not home, you don't get this money. And I, I think it just, it was designed to make shut-ins even more afraid to leave the house. Now, common misconception, Ed McMahon is often associated with Publishers Clearinghouse as as the person who would show up with a big check. But in actuality, <laughs> Ed Now Mc- we have to explain who Ed McMahon is. Ed McMahon was Johnny Carson's sidekick on the original, or or the Johnny Carson iteration of The Tonight Show, which preceded Jay Leno. Um, Ed, Ed McMahon would, like, just be the... Like, now, conversation he, listeners will know Jay Leno, so that's good. Now I see Jay, the connection. Yeah, yeah. Jay, yeah. Before Jay Leno, uh, there was 
Johnny Carson and before Jay Leno like uh, riffed off Kevin Eubanks, who would laugh at his stupid jokes. Ed McMahon would laugh at Johnny Carson's marginally superior jokes. And Mm -hmm. uh, Ed McMahon also worked for the rival to Publishers Clearinghouse called American Family Publishers. Now, the Ed McMahon commercials were very memorable because it's Ed McMahon showing up at at these, you know, Midwesterners' house. And he's like, ah, I'm Ed McMahon. I forget Ed McMahon's voice. I think he was like... uh, (laughs) He, uh, I'm Ed McMahon. No, that's it. You got it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think you say, "Yes, sir," or, or something like that. He would. He, he had like two catchphrases. But um, people people were famous for like basically nothing back then. It's not like today where everybody has to just hustle online and and toil and sweat. People could just be a late night sidekick and earn their fame that way. But. Ed McMahon never worked for Publishers Clearinghouse, but he's associated with Publishers Clearinghouse because Publishers Clearinghouse had the more memorable brand, but American Family Publishers had the more memorable commercials. And eventually the public just conflated. And that's how Mandela effects happen. Yes. Yeah. People misremember bits and pieces of things. I have the vaguest recollection of these commercials. It was, I, I guess it was always one of those things where they'd come on and I could very clearly see that it wasn't targeting me. So I just kind of ignored it. <laughs> Whereas me, I'm like a sponge. And even if it's not targeting me, I want to know more about it. I'm like, wait, <laughs> how do these people show up with a big check? What if you're not home? <laughs> what, oh, no, what I so- eventually developed that. Just not, you know, <laughs> yeah, not, not at that point. Not yet. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, like you said, Mandela effect. Ed McMahon never worked for Publishers Clearinghouse, so don't blame him for uh for, for buying candystand.com. He was already dead by that point, and he didn't ever work for them anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> It's not Ed McMahon's fault what happened to Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. It's yeah. important that we establish that. By the way, just speaking to the Mandela effect real quick, you know, I roll my eyes at mm-hmm. most of that. I wrote like how do you not know Nelson? Mandela was the president of South Africa. How do you think he died in prison? I I don't understand that. Um, Baron Baron Stein bears like you're you're just you never examined closely how it was spelled. But the one Mandela effect that blows my mind is the cornucopia in the Fruit of the Loom logo. Because Josh, I Dude, remember that's the one that gets me too. Yeah, yeah, I remember it distinctly, and they're telling me now that it never existed. No, no. I am being gaslit by Fruit of the Loom, and, and I will not back down from that. Anyway, so. Because you remember that's how you learned when a, what a cornucopia was in the first place, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's how we exactly. all learned. That's that's how 90s kids learned what a cornucopia was. And that's why nobody knows what a cornucopia is today, because the timeline shifted. <laughs> that one gets me, and Dilemma gets me. I remember... A teacher's aide in about third grade telling me that the word dilemma had an N in it. <laughs> and it doesn't. It's it's D-I-L-E-M-M-A. But she told me D-I-L-E-M-N-A. And I'm think, not alone on that one either. I think that's just like Dan Quayle telling school children how potato is spelled with an E at the end. And uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that you were just told incorrect information, Josh. Speaking of Carson bits. Yeah, so <laughs> CandyStand.com, we, we just told you who owned it, but it was actually a venture of the company that developed Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. So Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze was developed by the original minds behind CandyStand.com, Skyworks Technologies Incorporated which eventually took on the name of Skyworks Interactive. It was a studio founded in, some sources say 1995, some sources say 1996. I lean towards 1995 through my research. But it was founded by Gary Kitchen. And I I always think they founded this in Gary's kitchen, but his name is Gary Kitchen. Maybe they came up with the idea in Gary Kitchen's kitchen, but... I don't yeah, that like does, that doesn't mean they didn't found it there. Yeah, like maybe maybe they were sitting in Gary Kitchen's kitchen by the candy jar and they were like, wait a second. God, whenever I hear somebody who has a name like that, I'm just like, God, I bet they get sick of hearing that joke. I just I feel bad for them. Gary Kitchen, if you're listening, I'm sorry. Gary Kitchen's partner was David Crane. 
the same name as the son of Niles and Daphne from off of Frasier. And I, I think is, is a character in the God awful Frasier revival. But anyway, David Crane and Gary Kitchen founded Skyworks Interactive and founded candystand.com. I, I guess they went to the, the, the I, I don't, know how they made this pitch to Kraft Foods or if they like bounced around different corporate boardrooms saying this is how you advertise your product for the 21st century audience but uh, but but they eventually reached a deal with Kraft Foods and founded candystand.com now in addition to many of the games on candystand.com Skyworks also was responsible for numerous mobile titles and games on various uh, platforms. Games like South Park's Pinball, uh, Texas Hold'em Poker on the Game Boy Advance. That's right. Texas Hold'em Poker DS on the Nintendo DS. You're hearing me correctly. (laughs) Kong. King of Atlantis on the Game Boy Advance. Well, they had the pedigree. Uh, obviously, they were qualified to make that one. Their last credited mm-hmm. game was Boardwalk Ball Toss for the Nintendo DSi in 2011. And then the company just fell off the radar. I, I assume they're defunct. I don't know. They haven't made, they haven't been credited for a game since Boardwalk Ball Toss in 2011. Yeah, but Retro Studios hasn't been credited since 2014, so there's still a chance. Do you think Skyworks Interactive is helping develop Metroid Prime 4? <laughs> no, I think they're working on Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze Returns. That's my dream. We'll, we'll, we'll sleep on that one, Josh, and come back to it. So, <laughs> the, the original Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze was authorized by Nintendo in 2003 to help promote the recent release of the aforementioned Game Boy Advance remake of Donkey Kong Country. But very little is known about the origins of how this all came about. Did Skyworks approach Nintendo with his offer? Did Nintendo decide to license these outside browser games to promote their own published games? I don't really know. All I do know is that this was the only time this was done for Donkey Kong. So it, it was just kind of the right place at the right time. They had a product. They, they had a willing partner in Skyworks. They had a hot platform like Candy Stand. And they said, we're going to try this. Maybe if, if kids go to CandyStand.com, in addition to wanting to suck on the delicious sweet treats of Kraft Foods, they'll also want to suck on our delicious sweet Donkey Kong treat on the Game Boy Advance. This is before they started making the uh, game cartridges just taste terrible. This is back when you could suck on them with reckless abandon, Josh. You could. You could, yeah. (laughs) Actually, I'll tell you what. The newer Switch games are not nearly as spicy as the original ones. I have noticed that. I, I, I haven't tasted them in quite a while, but I, I thank you for bringing the spicy parlance into one of your episodes and not just making it the sole domain of Mitchell Wolf. That's true. Yeah. 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 I, that was an unintentional reference to MF Wolf, but <laughs> yeah, oh, he did a great job last episode. Props to him. <laughs> Speaking of which, Mitchell is in our live stream. I want to give a shout out to our live stream right now. We do live stream most conversations for our five dollar and up patrons, we got crowds tonight. Uh, this this midnight mass. A lot of people have shown up with candles to celebrate Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. You already mentioned Freezer. Hello to uh, Cornhorn Twenty Two Lawful Poe. We got uh, yeah. Those those are my people in particular. Yeah yeah. Your people. We got sales. Yeah they're on, they're on your side of the church. Uh, we got Porygon yeah. <laughs> Q on my side. Uh, <laughs> We'll check in with the live stream as we go, but you 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 mentioned that Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze would be forgotten if it weren't for DK Vine, and and I don't like to blow smoke up our ass all that much. I just don't like to do it. But you're absolutely correct in this case, Josh. 
because Donkey Kong mm-hmm. Country Barrel Maze would have been forgotten as soon as it was delisted on CandyStand.com if DK Vine did not have the foresight to illegally preserve it from CandyStand.com while it was still live and active. So you could actually what, still what, down- Was it illegal? <laughs> I, I assume it was illegal. It was not our property and we stole it. Well, it's kind of like uh, downloading an NFT, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, but you you just, you just downloaded the flash file. I think I think you're good. Now, rehosting it on your own site that might be that might be the iffy part. True. But I don't I don't think they're going to get you. I don't think they're going to come after us because we didn't really start advertising it on our main site until after it was gone from CandyStand.com. I was like, well, here's this piece of lost media that we had the foresight to preserve. And, you know, we have a we have a old game page for it. You can still download it on DKVine.com, although you will have to figure out your own workaround with the death of Flash. There, there are presumably ways to play it. At the very least, we have the file. It's not something like Dr. Mario World where it's just gone and, and there's mm-hmm. just no hope of recovering it unless somebody at Nintendo does some extremely shady shit and i'm hoping they do i'm hoping somebody loses their job over it because we need we need lost media preserved but um i don't actually want somebody to lose their job over it i hope they're already on their way out and they just you know burn their bridges but we we have donkey Kong country barrel maze preserved and we have been i mean the the only source online to find this game we're the only ones who have talked about it for several years, up until the point where somebody did an extensive article for it on Super Mario Wiki, which sort of legitimized it a little bit more beyond us just shouting at the moon that this game exists. But, yeah, I, I think we we kept the torch alive for Barrel Maze long past the, the point where it was extinguished at CandyStand.com. Now this is this is the, the the origin of it. It really is quite interesting because I remember you know specific Nintendo games would have like tie-in Flash games, but those would tend to be hosted on Nintendo.com. Do we know if this site, if this third-party site, uh, ever had any other games based on Nintendo properties or IPs? Josh, I didn't even know what the world's biggest Pokemon fan site was called until the last episode. You're asking the wrong person here. <laughs> Clef is Wigglytuff Pokemon Bonanza. I know what it's called. Come on. <laughs> I just shut out anything that isn't DKU related. My brain can only hold so much space. And a shocking portion of it is housing Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze information. So I don't <laughs> know. I, I know CandyStand.com did have like a partnership with Nintendo Wii when, when that was new. But I don't know okay. if there were any other licensed Nintendo games on CandyStand.com. Um, the reason I ask, because if the partnership continued, yeah. then that would seem to indicate that Barrel Maze was successful at what it set out to do. I don't know if it was successful what it set out to do. I mean, Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Advance was extremely successful. We've already talked about right. that this season on the conversation where the success of that game helped buoy the internal recognition of Donkey Kong Country at Nintendo and ultimately made them decide mm-hmm. that was the direction Donkey Kong needed to take. Through that, you know, a decade of identity crisis after the rare buyout where they weren't really sure if that was the direction Donkey Kong was going to continue forward or if they were going to reinvent it with like Jungle Beat or if they were going to go for a more arcade era throwback or, or what. They were just trying everything. And uh, so then is it is it safe to say in your estimation that without Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, the buyout era never ends? Probably not because is this the linchpin. I, I feel like <laughs> this came out probably too late to make a sizable impact on the sales of DKCGB. I'm sure someone out there learned about the existence of Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Advance, thanks mm-hmm. to Barrel Maze. But I would imagine those people who actually got roped in by this game, you could probably count them on two hands, maybe just one. And... 
maybe not even yeah, then they go by that. the gba game they're mad because it's nothing like barrel maze or like what yeah. is this shit yeah that, that side scrolling left to right what <laughs> my donkey kong is donkey on country barrel maze thank you very much <laughs> Oh man! So I, I, th- there's no way to measure what impact this actually had. Obviously, they didn't do one for Donkey Kong Country two. We, we, we can tell you that much. But mm-hmm. it, it's a curious case of a tie-in game, and like you said, Nintendo would often have flash games f- for like, going going back to the N sixty four releases. They they would have these really cheap. Flash games that would just reuse renders and and other assets from said game itself. They'd be very perfunctory. They would be very just basic, barely games at all. But this was a game game, right? There mm-hmm. there were original assets created for this. There was a bit of polish. It, it was rough around the edges for sure, but it it actually played like its own unique thing and it wasn't just this diversion on a website to the point where it had a ESRB rating which m- most of these flash games did not in fact have this was rated E for everyone by the ESRB and this is what tipped DK Vine off to hey is this actually a real video game because like i said this was a very confusing era where we had to start redefining what our assumptions had been because the video game industry was changing at a rapid pace. And suddenly we had this game. We we thought we knew what a video game was. And then we had this browser-based game with an ESRB rating that had original assets and had Donkey Kong in it. It, it Was this an actual Donkey Kong game? And we ultimately decided... Yeah, it, it actually is, which has led to some contention. Well, if this, why not this game? Or why not that game? And I'll get into that towards the end of the episode, because I really want to focus on Barrel Maze before we get into the also rans, the, the Mamie games that came in Barrel Maze's wake. Now, for my part, I, I do, I do feel a responsibility to bring up something at this point. Yeah. I do agree. Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is a real video game. It is a real Donkey Kong game. And it is really a part of the DKU. I have, I take no issue with that. However, I don't think it's because it was rated by the ESRB. <laughs> because, and this yeah. might blow your mind, I did yeah. not discuss this with Heil before this episode. I don't believe it was rated by the ESRB. You don't believe uh, if it If you was. go on the ESRB's website. Yeah. If you go on the ESRB's website, you can do a full search for any game that they've ever rated. And unfortunately, Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is not there. So I believe the that E that E the uh, the ESRB rating on the game's like title screen mm-hmm. was referring to the game that it was that it itself was advertising Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Advance, which is incredibly duplicitous on candystand.com's part then on skyworks technologies mm-hmm. part if that is indeed the case because they're using the esrb rating for the game that they're promoting which is not mentioned on barrel mace's title screen by the way mm-hmm. and they're saying this is rated e completely ignoring the full frontal nudity in level eight <laughs> well if the, no, i d- Nobody, including except for you, including the people who made the game, probably ever made it to level eight to see that. That's right. And you know, when when Funky Kong just walked out in a bathrobe and and mm-hmm. disrobed, I mean that that's where I always got a game over because I just I just lost control of the barrel right then and there. And um, no, I, I'm, that's how I'm, Candy Kong described it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gaslighting you. There's no full frontal nudity in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. It could be rated E for everyone if it in fact got an ESRB rating. I I think you may be correct. However, if this is in fact a Fanon ESRB rating, I'm fine with that too because <laughs> the guts it takes to just slap an ESRB rating on your product and 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 think yeah yeah 
that'll do. Uh, I, I almost admire <laughs> That's it. That's true, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you, you couldn't get away with it now, but in the Wild West days of the internet, sure. Sure, why not? No, I agree. A game does not have to have an ESRB or, or PEGI rating to have uh, official DKU status. That was a justification given at, on 2003 DK Vine, but I think it's, it's a whole lot of nonsense. I think we, we have to just look at well, what... A pegging rating would be for King of Swing. That's right. That's right. I think we have to look at what just... Uh, what goes into a game versus whether it's... And of course, everybody's going to have their different criteria for for where a game begins and, and where a just prom- interactable, promotionable, like gimmick thing on a website ends. Like it, it's it, it's a fine line. It's, it's what I'm saying. By virtue of yeah, because be- you're right. I'm I'm looking at the loading and title screen right now. That e- the the E for everyone rating is. By all, like, if you didn't know better, yeah. basically, there's no reason you'd think that it doesn't refer to this game that you're looking at. Yeah. And, you know, the difference is this was on CandyStand.com. This wasn't on the Donkey Kong Country website, you know? Mm-hmm. So I I think it's just elevated slightly above some of these other games, like the Donkey Kong 64 trivia game that you could play on the Donkey Kong 64 website. I, I think, I think this is just uh, a kind of a step above those. And some people may quibble with, well, if you include this, you should include those, but we can definitely include this because this is a real game, Josh. This, this is fully developed. It's got 10 levels. It's got original assets. And I would argue, it has an original story. Now, okay, when I when I say an original story, there is no plot. There there is no actual plot to Donkey Kong Country Barrel Mace. But I believe, as I often do, that one can easily be surmised by observing the gameplay. And what is the gameplay of Barrel Mace? You may ask the majority of people who have never played Barrel Mace. Josh, would you like to explain it? Because I, I've talked so much internally <laughs> to myself about Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. I've, I've talked so much about Barrel Maze on the DK Vine forum, on social media over the years. But very rarely do I have the opportunity to sit back and let someone talk to me about Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. And I would really love to just hear it from your mouth if you don't have a Nintendo cartridge in there right now, <laughs> explain to me All right, Dunk- how you play Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. Okay, so full disclosure, part of this is just going off of memory. Okay. I can step in and, and, and help you out if sure. you stumble. Okay. Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is... What would the genre even be described as? Isometric. Okay. You, you, I, I would. You play as a as a rolling barrel on its side from an isometric perspective. You move the barrel around the playfield using, I believe, your keyboard's arrow keys. That's correct. The barrel reacts somewhat realistically to the terrain and physics of the environment. There are, there are ramps, there are launchers. So the idea is you can, you can roll quote unquote downhill. And I say downhill, but like the, all the terrain is at a very like specific angle. It, there, there, there are no curves. There are under, there are only pivots in the terrain, but you can roll over basically ramps and launch your barrel down slopes and off of obstacles and there are for example hippopotamuses that pop in and out of rushing rapids and your goal in each level is to roll your barrel around this isometric environment uh picking up bananas and bringing them to donkey kong who was who was waiting at the end and when this when you do this 
uh, he does a celebratory dance and Diddy Kong swings in on a vine from the side. The game is punishing, however, in that you have a limited, num- a very limited stock of lives. The controls themselves are very, very sensitive. And the isometric perspective makes it very easy to roll the barrel off of cliffs if you're not extremely, extremely careful. And there are also other hazards, such as rolling boulders and and the aforementioned hippos who pop in and out of the water, so you have to sort of time that. Uh, d- have, I, have I gotten most of it, would you say? I, I would say those are the broad basics. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, the, the barrel that you control you go through 10 stages and and i would say these stages are a treacherous series of canyons in the congo jungle now the barrel can only withstand so much damage because it is a barrel right and each level is on a timer the the times for each level can range from as long as 5 minutes as level one gives you all the way to a perilous 30 seconds to complete a level. Now more time can be earned by collecting hourglass collectibles, but yes, you, you, you like you have less and less time as the game progresses to complete these far more difficult levels and I would say it very quickly ramps up in difficulty. Yes, especially when they add even more ramps. So mm-hmm. you, you have to reach Donkey Kong, who's waiting at the goal of every level. Like, there's a little checkered platform that Donkey Kong, an actual model of Donkey Kong. And I haven't been able to determine if this is an original model of Donkey Kong or if it was borrowed from a pre-existing game like Mario Party 4 or something. Um... It animates very jerkily. It, it looks yeah. like it's taken from like cutout screenshots uh, of 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 some sort of a GameCube era game. Yeah, it, it it looks better than any other Kong in the game, which we'll get to. But yeah, you got mm. you got to reach reach Donkey Kong at the end of the level. You got to beat all the levels, and also you can try to get the high score for bragging rights. I guess there's there's really no benefit to getting the high score. <laughs> By by the end of it, I didn't give a damn about my score. I just wanted to beat the game, beat the levels, and say, I beat Dog Gun Country Barrel Maze. And that's it. That's the game. Again, it's a Shockwave game from 2003 that was on a website used to promote the Lifesavers candy brand. So you're not going to get Breath of the Wild here, right? You're not going to get something that is this groundbreaking, genre-busting testament to game design oh breath of the wild wishes it could be this yeah we'll we'll put that on the t-shirt josh and, and we'll we'll credit it <laughs> to josh wallen from off of the geek critique <laughs> now i also you talk about the damage meter i i will say your damage meter is represented on the hud by a banana that turns red um but i do notice Drain that damage meter drains from things that like you have to do in the regular course of completing a level. For instance, you, when you roll over rough terrain, that that increments the damage meter. When you fall from a great, from, when you fall from basically any height at all, that takes some of your damage meter. So you really do have to be very careful in how you navigate and time your, your the, the the rolling of your barrel through these levels. Yes, and as you already mentioned, you control the barrel using the arrow keys on your keyboard. So, Mm -hmm. left, up, down, right. So, you don't have a varied, like, in-depth control scheme. It's very, very rudimentary, and that makes it very, very frustrating, especially because... Is excruciatingly sensitive, Josh. Like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't take much to get this barrel moving. And that means it doesn't take much to get the barrel careening off the edge to its smashing defeat. And then there's another life wasted. So, this, this game kicked my ass 
in 2003, let me tell you. I did not beat it until 2010. Long mm. after it was on candystand.com, but after we preserved it on DK Vine, I, I was able to defeat it with the benefit of seven years of age and wisdom and learned patience coming right and the and the excitement for the upcoming release of dkc returns so i beat it after dkc returns had come out uh, i i i mm. went to barrel maze right after i beat mario kart double dash and mario kart double dash was of course another uh grueling slog for me because as i already mentioned infamously i forced myself to complete all of Double Dash using Donkey and Diddy Kong in the DK Jumbo, which is the absolute worst possible combination of characters and vehicle in the game. And after that, I was like, yeah, I can do anything. And so I sat down and I beat Barrel Maze. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So that's that's the basic gameplay of Barrel Maze. How can you gleam a plot it from that is the question. And we we should also say when when we talk about your high score, the other collectible in the game appears to be gold and gold and silver barrels, right? Which uh, which which increment your score. Yeah. So uh, again, like you said, I see why you said that you just didn't give a shit about your score very quickly because trying to get those inevitably will lead to you losing more lives, which will lead to you. Not, once again, having to start the game all the way over. Because it is one of those games. There are no continues. There is no candy save point in this. There's no Kong College or save cave. There's no automatic saving. It's, you lose all your lives, you have to start from the beginning. It it, it feels very, like, arcade where, oh, yeah. It, it does. You, you really want to get a high score. I was like, why do I want to get a high score? I want to beat the game. Well, you got to get a high score. That's what a video game is. I'm not going to do that. Like most... Like most Flash, like most Shockwave games of this era, I'm quite sure that this game is based on a mishmash of 80s era arcade games. Yeah. Yeah. And it's as hard as an 80s era arcade mm -hmm. game. Thankfully, it's only 10 levels and there's no like Donkey Kong arcade style. We're just going to start you over in the beginning and it's going to be even harder. How far can you get? Or it's like Super Mario mm -hmm. Brothers, you know, like not, none of that. Not, none of what Cranky Kong says, you know, and... And then you beat it and they make you start over from the beginning. Like, none of that. It's once you're done, you're done. You can play it again, but who cares? Th this would likely be one of Cranky Kong's favorite DKU games, though. I, I think out of all the Donkey Kong Country games, he would like this one up until Tropical Freeze, which that would be his favorite because he's playable in that one. Because he's a hypocrite, mm -hmm. right? All he cares about really <laughs> is his own glory. And that's why he's cranky, because he was forced into retirement. So saying all of that, how can you possibly squeeze any semblance of story out of this? How can I, the lore fanatic for the Donkey Kong universe, say, you know what was a good time thinking about it on an intellectual level? Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. Like, I know I'm a ridiculous human being, Josh, but do I not have my limits? And yes, I have my limits, but apparently DKC... BM, which terrible, <laughs> terrible abbreviation there. Apparently, this BM didn't cause me to strain all that hard because I have figured out some semblance of a fan and plot for this game. Now, we, we control a barrel, right? We, we go around and we collect bananas. And in fact, when you get to Donkey Kong, at the end of every level, the barrel is then flipped um, right side up and Donkey Kong digs the bananas out of the barrel. So, very logically, I said to myself, ah, Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is the previously unseen story of how Donkey Kong actually goes about collecting the bananas for his banana hoard. Because we... He just has a cave full of bananas, Josh. We never know how he actually procures these. I mean, it it seems like it's a lot of work, right? So, he's dropped into dangerous territory in the Congo jungle. And with the help of what I call the remote control barrel, or the RCB, 
he collects banana bunches as well as other treasures along the way, facing obstacles, maybe the intervention of the Kremlins, now living on Donkey Kong Island, and much more. It's a day in the life of Donkey Kong, the closest thing we see to him working for a living outside of going on these massive adventures. That's my fan and plot of Barrel Maze. I mean, honestly, that doesn't even sound like an extrapolation to me. I mean, it's it's all right there on the page, Kyle. That is obviously <laughs> and clearly exactly what is what is happening and what the intent of this adventure always was. That's exactly what Gary Kitchen and David Crane wanted us to take away from this game. And the fact that they're able to communicate that through the simple elegance of their arrow key device gameplay shows <laughs> why they were able to get Nintendo on board with this in the first place. Yeah, I mean the pitch meeting would have been would have been so easy. It it's I, I bet Nintendo was kicking themselves saying, Why didn't we think of that? Yes, and I I bet they're scrambling now to devise <laughs> a candy stand edition for Nintendo Switch Online. You know, Nintendo Switch Online plus candy stand <laughs> to preserve this classic game from the comfort of your home console. I realize uh, they, they would have to release a keyboard peripheral for the Switch, though. I, I, I mean, that could like I, I refuse to play this game at, without the intended keyboard controls. The, the fact that they released the Super Nintendo controller and N64 controller and even a Sega Genesis controller, Josh, shows me mm -hmm. that they're not above releasing, you know, like like an old iMac keyboard. For the Nintendo Switch? Oh, yeah. It would have to be authentic. I, yeah. Uh, my, my pick would be getting one of those cheap-ass black keyboards uh, by partnering with Dell. They could even bring in the dude you're getting a Dell guy from the vintage Dude, we were on the same page there. I was about to say that. <laughs> oh, my God. I would love to watch that guy. It's, it's all there. I would love to watch that guy <laughs> play Barrel Maze. That would just be the culmination of all my life's work right there. <laughs> So I, I realize we're losing the audience here, right? We're, we? we're, we're well, speaking how? in tongues at our midnight mass. We're, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is nonsense to most people, especially those people who have not played the game. I'm hoping we're articulating this enough for those who weren't there. Now, this wouldn't be a conversation spotlight without celebrating the characters of Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. And there are characters in this game. This would not be a DKU game if we did not have physical appearances of pre-existing characters. Just like, as you mentioned, Ryan Stiles, from Whose Line Is It Anyway, is it actually a native DKU character because he made his video game debut in Conquer Live and Reloaded's demo disc. Oh, he's more than a character. He he is a DK Vine Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's on this Wikipedia page and everything. <laughs> he he made it in before Donkey Kong himself. Yeah, it's because that's true. just how important he is. Yes, he's very important. Yeah. So let's talk about the characters of Barrel Maze, and of course, we need to talk about the RCB, the remote controlled barrel. Sure. The RCB is what you, the player, sees most of the time. However, as I said, we can assume that Donkey Kong is actually the one controlling this barrel in universe. He He's at the end of the level in the safe zone that he's been dropped off in with, with a remote control trying to steer this barrel in the dangerous terrain, getting the bananas along the way. Now, the timer on each level, I assume, is the battery pack for the RCB. And so... When you start, you know, the, the RCB has five minutes of battery life. This was 2003, you know. I mean, it, it, it sucks up battery life more than a Game Gear did, all right? But as, as, you, as you go on, it has less and less battery life. But, you know, and, and so Donkey Kong's task becomes all the harder. Now, I would assume, I would assume though, that... The battery life can be explained even better because honestly, 
Mobile batteries were getting pretty good by 2003, but they were not very good in 1993. So in line with what you were saying earlier about this this game depicting the events of how Donkey Kong got the banana horde in the first place, this must take place before Don- before the events of Donkey Kong Country. No. No, it it, it I think this takes no. place in 2003 for reasons I will get into Interesting. in just a little bit, but no, I think while battery life surely did improve by 2003, the Kongs are always going off of slightly more archaic technology. We see in Donkey Kong Country Tropical Fair. Freeze that they actually scavenge a lot of technology from the outside world via plane crashes, shipwrecks, b- you know, boat wrecks, and the like. And so, mm-hmm. plus, I assume Donkey Kong's been at this for quite a while, and so this is probably older technology that maybe was devised in 1993, but he's still using a decade okay. later. So, you know, just like your phone's battery life degrades over time, so too does the RCB. And it, it, this probably goes without saying, but we we believe the RCB was was developed by Funky Kong. Of course, that goes without saying. In fact, I would argue that Funky Kong is one of the characters in this game, even though we never see him. More on that in just a bit. Mm. Because the character we do see right next to Donkey Kong, you already mentioned him, is Diddy Kong. Now, Diddy Kong has a very minimal role in this game. It's more of a just cameo, literally a drop-in appearance. Now, Diddy appears on the title screen. He appears on the loading screen. But they're always just renders repurposed from Donkey Kong 64. Donkey Kong 64 was still the most recent um, art asset like that were in play. Obviously, renders from Donkey Kong Don- renders for Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Advance were in actuality renders from Donkey Kong 64. Like the the box art was just. DK64 renders of Donkey and Diddy, and thus this render, two renders of Diddy seen in Barrel Maze are just repurposed renders from Donkey on 64. The the in-game appearance of Diddy dropping in on a rope is is just a render of him hanging on a rope. But because yeah, l- looking at it, it it almost appears to be, but because what happens is when he comes in, it it goes with this very cheap flash motion tweening effect. Yeah, that causes his as the as the rope swings back and forth, his body sort of lightly moves in a in a in a very unappealing and uncanny way. <laughs> so yeah, Diddy does the quivering thing you have to do to be Canary Mary and Banjo Tui, where you just have to start trembling mm. your whole like uh lower arm and he, that yeah you know, diddy just kind of starts jerking uncomfortably <laughs> phrasing i know so this render of diddy drops down which is representative of diddy actually being there in game and as donkey kong digs out as, as this nebulous model of donkey kong presumably from a GameCube game, digs out this banana bunch from the barrel. Diddy drops down on the rope, just from the sky. And I like to think that Funky has airlifted Donkey Kong into these dangerous regions of the Congo, and Diddy's tagging along in the barrel plane, and then he drops down on the rope, and Donkey Kong's successful, and he's like... Hey donkey! Hey, 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 DK! Uh, grab this rope! Let's go! Let's get out of here! And Donkey Kong picks up the RCB, and then, and then they they get airlifted to the next level. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now <laughs> note, Josh, that Diddy's Donkey Kong sixty four render physically being in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze means this is an unusual occurrence. This is a post Mario Golf Toadstool Tour appearance of diddy where he's not wearing the prosthetic golfing fingers that's true they they did not repurpose the artist set to add that no so we can only assume that he just didn't bring him along this day this is when they were still new and he wasn't you know he, he was like oh I, I i'm not gonna wear them these this day we're just going out getting bananas for the horde 
I don't need to wear my prosthetic golfing fingers and toes. And so it, it, it takes time to break them in. Yeah, it, it does. And and now, you know, you see them with them all the time. You never not see Diddy wearing those prosthetic golfing fingers. But I think this is our canon evidence of the existence of prosthetic <laughs> golfing fingers. Because I've had some people argue to me, well, you know, Heil, this is stupid. This notion that Diddy puts on these like golfing gloves that give him an extra digit on each hand and foot. And, 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 and wh- wh- what are you saying? Like, he still has his like original four fingers on each hand underneath these. No, it, this is just a retcon. Did he never had four fingers? He's always supposed to have five fingers. And I say, explain his appearance in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, which takes place immediately after Mario Kart Double Dash. You can't do it unless you subscribe to the theory. And I think confirm fact of prosthetic golfing fingers. Yeah. Heil, you can, in your position as DK Vine editor in chief, you can't say this, so I will say this for you. Anyone who tells you that prosthetic golfing fingers are stupid can go fuck themselves. Just go fuck yourself. The evidence, as you said, is right here. It's right here on the screen. I would say to go do that because it's an important part of any sexual health. Uh, <laughs> you know, have at it, but. Sure, yeah. I I would just say look at the evidence. And if you say it's nonsense, you have not looked at the evidence as closely as I have. Because I've looked at Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, I've stared into its soul, Josh, and I walk away (laughs) knowing the truth about Diddy Kong. Now, I would also put forth the possibility that at least on some of these levels, perhaps Diddy Kong is up in the barrel plane, and he, in fact, is the one that sometimes is controlling the remote control barrel. That's and possible. And perhaps he just found, because he was used to it, that using the remote control was easier without the prosthetic golfing fingers. Now, what that would mean is we have to do a follow-up episode at some point. We have to go back through Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze and figure out which levels were plausibly <laughs> uh, controlled by Donkey Kong piloting the RCB and which levels were diddy at the controls of the rcb if they were in fact switching off and i will be happy to do that episode but for now we should probably stay focused on what we've already got because that could be a whole topic unto itself and we haven't done the research unfortunately we just haven't done it right right cranky kong cranky kong makes an appearance in donkey Kong country barrel maze however he only appears on the title screen on the game over screen and on the end-of-game victory screen. And the render Mm -hmm. is from Donkey Kong Country. It's just him in his rocking chair. So, I I assume they went with the Donkey Kong Country era render because there were no renders for Cranky Kong from Donkey Kong 64. And the one from Donkey Kong Country 2 is not in a rocking chair. And a static render of a rocking chair is far easier to quasi-animate in Flash than him mm-hmm. wobbling around on two canes. That all checks out. But I, but the question that I have then is, what's he doing up there? I think Cranky, like, maybe, maybe came along with him that day, but he didn't want to fly around in the barrel plane. So he's just, he's been dropped off at, like, the, the departure point. To reach this canyonous region of the Congo jungle. Because he's up on kind of like a, a a cliffside overlooking a jungle here. And so he's just he's just there to like watch them take off and wish them well and greet them upon their return. And maybe rub it in Donkey Kong's face that he didn't get as many bananas as he would have gotten had he been out there with the RCB. Now we have seen, for example, in the credits of Donkey Kong Country 1 that Cranky's rocking chair appears to be at least it appears to be mobile at least to some degree as in he can rock back and forth across the screen uh during during the character parade at the end of the game so it's it's also possible that he's just he knows this mountainous region very well himself and i i would postulate perhaps he is helping to guide them through it although i would argue how much in canon those character parades are considering that would imply that all the characters can just like moonwalk very easily 
and the aquatic and or fit in Donkey Kong's treehouse. Yeah, yeah, the aquatic characters can just float through the air without the need of any water whatsoever. So I, I always take those with a grain of salt. They're more representative than anything else. But sure. um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Cranky Kong can move a fair amount of distance in his rocking chair. He's probably he's mm-hmm. probably uh, skilled at it. If he can bounce on his cane, I'm I'm sure. Um, gliding around about in his rocking chair is, isn't that far off from plausibility. Well, there are also, uh, there, there aren't any animal buddies in this game, but you did mention the hippos. And I feel like the hippos are worth c- kind of giving a, a little bit of shine to because these are the first time hippos appear in a Donkey Kong game. Minus, of course, uh, Scoff. From off of Donkey Kong 64, the nipple piercing enthusiast. Minus Ska? Scoff. Ska. Not Ska. <laughs> ska. Stop, stop <laughs> thinking about your favorite musical genre, Josh. I'm talking about the nipple piercing enthusiast, Scoff, partner of You Trough. can see why I would have Ska on the brain, though. Yes, of course. I, I have the damn song on repeat in my brain. I can't get it out of my brain after compiling my show notes, after doing all the research for this episode. It's going to be in there when I try to go to bed after we're done with this <laughs> midnight recording. And you'll have no trouble going to sleep. You'll just drift off with, with the with the, the gentle, uh, relaxing sound of that one ska song just on repeat forever and ever. Yeah, as I imagine the RCB shattering time and time again... <laughs> rolling off a cliff or getting pelted with a coconut. The hippos. These are unironically, I think my favorite aspect of Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. I absolutely adore the hippos because this is the first time that we have seen wild hippos in a Donkey Kong game. Like I said, Scoff was a character, but Scoff was more of the, the cartoony, like Professor Chops vein of anthropomorphic animal whereas right. these these hippos read to me more like your rambies your in guards they're more wild animals on donkey kong islands and they're they're just uh they're they're just chilling in the the river seen in level two and level eight of barrel maze and and I just love the way they look we only see them from again it's isometric so we only see them from the top but just the way they look, it's so gloriously shiny. Like, they're, mm-hmm. they're just wet, wet hippos. And I, they don't look out of place in the world of Donkey Kong. They look like, like if if we could see their eyes, which we can't see, I would imagine they would look quite a bit like the Bopamotamus from Donkey Kong Country Returns, um, which, which were the hippos that appeared... Uh, as part of like the the brainwashed animal army of the Tiki Tac tribe that right. Donkey and Diddy could bounce on the heads of to cross great platforms. The hippos in this game serve a very similar function. You can use them to cross the river, but you have to be quick because they go back down um, and, and then they come back up for air. Now, I do notice that these hippos always come in pairs of two. That's they, right. They, you 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 never see a single hippo. Uh, do you think that? Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the gameplay, that's so that the barrel the the barrel sprite, which is quite wide, can can sensibly pass over them. Do you think in universe these hippos are pair bonded in some way? I do. I think these hippos right. are when when the barrel's not there, just having the most vigorous sex. You can ever imagine. <laughs> that would explain why there are so many of them in those levels. But unfortunately, Josh, uh, Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze was either rated E by the ESRB or was falsified as E by the ESRB. And so they had to cut the full on <laughs> hippo intercourse. And what a shame that was. I mean, that, that does help explain though why the hippos are so lovingly rendered and why their, their, their skin is so shiny. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're damp with perspiration. <laughs> they spent more time getting the gleam, the glisten on the hippos <laughs> just right than they did making sure the barrel could control properly. But 
I appreciate the art well, direction that's not, nonetheless. That's not really important. No. I love these hippos, Josh. Whenever I think about Barrel <laughs> Maze, the very first thing that comes to my mind was, those are pretty great hippos. Because you know me. They, they I, are. They, they legitimately are. I, I love looking at the wildlife of Donkey Kong Island. It's it's why, like, the, the Banjo-Kazooie-fication of Donkey Kong, starting with Donkey Kong 64, kind of rankles me a little bit because it just feels tonally out of place for what Donkey Kong was prior to that. And yes, Banjo-Kazooie takes place in the same shared universe as Donkey Kong. I love Banjo-Kazooie. But I didn't want those elements brought into a mainline Donkey Kong game. Diddy Kong Racing is fine because that's a Diddy Kong game. But Donkey Kong 64, all of a sudden we have beetles racing you and and rabbits racing you and and owls racing you. And, And I'm just like, all right, all right. Like I was fine with simians. I was fine with Kremlins. I was fine with bears. But now it's getting a little ridiculous. But I just love animal buddies that, you know, are are basically just wild animals that the Kongs have befriended that almost act as, like, their exotic pets. You know, Rambi is a big dog. And I, I, I like that element of Donkey Kong that I feel like has been lost since 1999. And so the notion of wild hippos, an animal type we never saw during the Rare Era, except for the aforementioned nipple-piercing enthusiast, I, I really like it. I, I I think it adds a lot to Donkey Kong's world, to Donkey Kong Island, to say that there are hippos in the river. So yeah, yeah, they're 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 my favorite. And, and, and more broadly, Barrel Maze does have a fairly, I guess, as realistic and aesthetic as you would expect a Flash game from two thousand three that is basically advertising candy and a Game Boy Advance tie-in game. As much as it could be expected to have, because yeah. yes, the the hippos are realistic, the textures are real, are, are fairly realistic. Yeah, when, there, when, there's nothing here that's breaking too far away from the donkey from the established uh, pre DK sixty four Donkey Kong Country aesthetic. Yeah, when I said that the elites of Donkey Kong fandom escaped Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, and we don't need our own fancy private islands, it's because the nature presented in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is so realistic, we have no need to seek it out in real life. <laughs> but I will say, though, I, no- I noticed the hippos are not the only wildlife that appear in the game. They're not. They're not. Um, there, there are some recognizable characters that appear in Barrel Maze. There are the enemies of mm-hmm. DKC BM, and let's start with the true antagonist of the RCB, Josh. Let's talk about the bad remote control barrels. This is just conjecture. There's no official name for these. Uh, I also call these the Kremlin remote control barrels. These are ki- kind of... Um, they, they look like oil drums almost, but they're just like... I think they're barrels painted black... But they've got a skull and crossbones design on the top, which kind of evokes the character of Dum Drum, the boss from right. Donkey Kong Country. The the skull and crossbones is also evocative of both the Kremlin Jolly Roger seen on the pirate faction of Kremlins in DKC2, DK Donkey Kong Land 2, and Donkey Kong 64, but also the Kremlin skull insignia that would debut in the Paeon era and appear throughout the, like um, numerous things represented by the Kremlins in those games, including their clothing. So, yeah, I think these are Kremlin remote control barrels that the Kremlins now living on Donkey Kong Island after the events of DKC2, of course. Um, they're, they're kind of... Um, being antagonistic towards Donkey Kong. They want these bananas too. And rather than just trying to steal from his horde again, they're trying to just cut him off at the source and trying to get uh, some banana bunches of their own. I do notice that these barrels, what what they appear to try to do is they'll 
roll toward you and attempt to knock you into the rapids or knock you off of cliffs. Yeah. Um, I do notice that they don't appear to, uh, to understand how to interface with the hippos because once you get far enough away from them, they, they, they seem to just spin out. So perhaps, perhaps it is the case that the hippos do not like the Kremlings and would not allow them to pass. No, well, I'm sure there are many Kremlins who have adapted to life on Donkey Kong Island in the Congo jungle and are good neighbors. Mm. Because not all Kremlins are part of the Kremlin crew. This is important, right? Um, There there are some Kremlins who are good-natured, who want nothing to do with King K. Rool's machinations. And so they're they're living their life. Some Kremlins just want nothing to do with it. We know Calypso opened a nightclub on Donkey Kong Island. It's kind of a haven for Kremlin refugees. Uh, but there are still people, there are still Kremlins who subscribe to Carol's philosophies and who very much are there to be a thorn in the Kong side. And I'm sure the wildlife of Donkey Kong Island, um, they, they don't care for them. They, they don't care for these, mm-hmm. these Kremlins who are not living in harmony with the ways of the Congo. So, yeah. Hip, hip, hippos are gonna, gonna sink the Kremlin RCBs. Now, mm-hmm. that's conjecture, of course. We don't know that the Kremlins are actually controlling those barrels. But there is a familiar Donkey Kong baddie that explicitly appears in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. Neckies, the famous vultures from Donkey Kong Country and Donkey Kong Country 2, and Donkey Kong 64, kind of, and, and King of, Sw- King of Swing, and, you know, Pounds games. They appear in levels 3, 8, and 9, and they fly overhead, and they, they look like neckies, but they, they kind of, it's, it's hard to tell if they're supposed to be neckies <laughs> or if they're just basic buzzards or vultures but we know they're neckies because they, they they look like they might have some they might think about maybe forming a, a committee to maybe might probably not be an art asset that came in some sort of a pre-created pack perhaps 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 but, but- Josh. But on the other hand, they could also just be the Neckies we know and love. Yes, and we are led to believe they are the Neckies we know and love because of right. their weapon of choice, because they drop coconuts on your barrels. And we, we know one thing about Nucky, Neckies is they love spitting their nuts. Right. So, yeah, the, the Neckies will fly overhead and they will drop coconuts on the RCB. And, uh, when I when I finally got to level three, which, which took me quite a long time, I think level three might have been as far as I ever got in two thousand three. But <laughs> what a, what a high note to go out on for seven years because I was like, oh my god, they actually have neckies in this game, uh, which wasn't a deep cut at the time. Like I would say, it's a deeper cut now because of just the weird journey Doc Young's been on as a property since 2010. But it was still something I appreciated to see back then. You know, like even then, you know, uh, a year into the buyout, it was always nice to see things referenced. Right. After that, but yeah, uh, they, we... the 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 Neckies do also sort of screw you up in a in a secondary way in that as they fly overhead they cast that not only their do their character models like block your perspective and and again the isometric perspective already makes this game very finicky and very difficult to to like keep track of what the cliffs are the neckies also cast shadows onto the world yeah so that that can make navigation the the combination of their character model and their shadows can make navig- just basic navigation even harder than it already is yeah yeah um but I like the neckies I don't dread the neckies as much as I dread the boulders, which are mm-hmm. one of the more reoccurring obstacles i'm i I'm loath to call them baddies because they're just environmental hazards. 
but environmental hazards with agency. Let's say boulders. <laughs> they, they do appear to have agency. Yeah. yeah. Boulders appear in levels three, four, six, seven, eight, and ten, and mm-hmm. uh, they 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 basically just r- try to roll into the RCB, but it it seems like they purposely chase it as well. Yeah, we we say they have agency because some of them, not all of them, so, so, some of them are just rolling around. Uh, all willy nilly. Some of them do not appear to activate or even start to move at all until the RCB gets close to them. At which point they they will seemingly hone in on it in a not dissimilar way to the way that the Kremlin remote control barrel does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you know, boulders are an archetype. I, I think Indiana Jones, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, just made the notion of a rolling boulder chasing you just. It's like part and parcel with any genre fiction. Oh, we're we're in the jungle. We're we're in a we're in a tomb. We're in a this ancient shrine. Here comes the boulder. Here comes the boulder. Like Mario Party did it, you know. So that's right. that's all well and good. But what a lot of boulders! Like what is going on here? That there are so many <laughs> boulders, and why is the ground so unstable that these boulders continually roll without? any seeming mechanism to get them going. It's like a perpetual motion machine, these boulders. I don't understand it. I don't understand how this works. Well, I would I would theorize that perhaps the... This game... This game's depiction of events... More... Like all video... Like all DKU games, to some extent, you need to make some sort of an allowance that these are video gamified depictions of events that actually happened in the DKU. Um, but this one in particular, you you really need to do that. So I would theorize that while the ground that we see in this gamified version does appear to be composed primarily of, of shapes of just a few angles, in the real actual adventure that really happened on, on, on DK Island, um, the ground was, of course, not made up of i of these isometric bricks hmm and and that explains why the boulders were able to move in a more realistic way so what you're saying josh is that gary kitchen and david crane they paid off rare's own spy to the rare archipelago now for those who don't <laughs> know the lore behind this rare in universe has an explorer that they send to the rare archipelago to spy and catalog and basically write down the events of what's happening there. His name is Horace St. James Go Lightly. And this was established in Viva Pinata, but it explains in universe why there are video games for all of these characters and why in the video games they know they are in video games so you're saying that gary kitchen david crane were able to hire horace st james go lightly to catalog the events in the life of donkey kong's day when he took out the rcb and then uh go lightly came back to them came back to Candyland HQ, Skyworks Technologies, and said, this is what I found. And then right. they kind of exaggerated what was depicted. Well, I don't know if you'd say exaggerated or not. Mm. By the way, the one correction I would make is I believe that Go Lightly contacted them. Okay. Right? I think that they made they made the contract with Nintendo, and then Go Lightly contacted them and said, well... I heard through my connections that you're making a Donkey Kong game. We need to, we need to strive for historical accuracy. So here's some ideas of what it could be about, and uh, and and that's what the, that's what they went with. But yeah, I, I I wouldn't say so much exaggerated though, as much as gamified the concept. Or maybe Nintendo's told them that the one condition of them making a game is they had to first talk to Go Lightly. Like you have to go through right. him before you can make a Donkey Kong game. Sure, of course. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I could see that, although I am hesitant to say that 
the what is depicted in Barrel Maze strays too far from the actual reality. It could just be that the mm-hmm. ground was incredibly unstable in that part of the Congo jungle, much in the same way that the ground was unstable underneath our feet in 2003 as the video game industry shifted <laughs> around us. Yes, but much in the same way, this may be a, a sort of metaphorical um, mind palacing of the events. Yes, but that yes. but that is true. This the 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 terrain in this game does represent, and this game itself does represent very well how it felt to be a Donkey Kong fan in two thousand three. That's right. That's right. We didn't know what the future entailed. We didn't know that the future of Donkey Kong Country as a brand was inherently secure. Just like we wouldn't know that Retro Studios would be developing Donkey Kong Country Returns for release in 2010, which brings us to the next baddie in the game, Josh. Now, these are Venus flytraps that appear in levels 5 and 8. And if you get too close to them, they will take a bite out of the RCB. Now, what's so interesting about these... And what makes Donkey Kong lore such a damn treat to discuss is how closely these Venus flytraps adhere to the look of the Venus flytraps that would be introduced by Retro in Donkey Kong Country Returns. So Retro introduced a variety of Venus flytrap that would become the native Venus flytrap of Donkey Kong Island, sort of the Donkey Kong take on the piranha plant. And these would be called chomp plants, not to be confused with Chomps the Shark from Donkey Kong Country. Chomps the Shark is presumably named after the chomp plant in universe, or maybe vice versa. But these uh, chomp plants, they look like a l- more detailed, more rugged version of the piranha plant. They, they, they kind of have, um, like, toothy mouths, yes, but they're, they look, I think, more like plants. They're, they're more like, um, covered in leaves, and they, they look a little bit like the plant from Little Shop of Horrors mixed with, um, a piranha plant, I, I guess. Um, and, and the, these, I'm just going to call them chomp plants in Barrel Maze. They just, they, they kind of look like purple versions of the, the plants seen in Returns and Tropical Freeze and, and other games that utilize the retro aesthetics. And I think we can say that through retroactive continuity, this would make Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze the very first appearance of the chomp plant. Yeah, honestly, so, the I don't believe to my to my knowledge that I ever made it to level five. Um, <laughs> but I will say if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, these chomp plants dominate the left hand side of the episode art of this episode. And I was looking at this at this episode at this art for some time throughout most of this episode before it really occurred to me, like, wait a minute. I've seen those things before. Like, they they did not look in any way, shape, or form out of place with what I expected of Donkey Kong Country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is kind of one of those accidental continuity things that, of course, of course, Retro did not play Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. I mean, maybe. Because they say they played every Donkey Kong Country and land game in preparation for Returns. And they were also inspired by Banjo-Kazooie, oddly enough. But I don't think they were including Barrel Maze in that. Maybe they were. And maybe they said, you know those uh, Venus flytraps from levels 5 and 8? What if we make those baddies in the game? Maybe that's actually what happened. But I usually chalk this stuff up to just a happy accident that, oh, the, like, like you said, I, like, maybe, maybe these were devised from the ground up by Skyworks technology. Maybe these are pre-existing art assets that they just plopped in the game. I don't know. But they look quite a bit like the plants that would appear in Donkey Kong Country Returns 
onward. And it's just one of those things that you just link up and you're like, oh, you know what? It works. It it looks like this was all planned out by one mastermind. And I am I like that that's what makes being a Doc Young fan so fun to me is like we're the only ones really paying attention to all of these fine details, you know, across all these separate disparate studios across the years. But when you can make this connection and say, well, actually, Chomp Plants first appeared <laughs> in 2003's Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, then um, that's what makes me sleep well at People night. People will look like will look at you like you're a very reasonable, normal person. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And um, uh, Freezer in the stream chat points out that these plants also resemble the plants from off of Crash Bandicoot. So the strange bedfellows connection never ends. Yeah, yeah. Donkey Kong Freedom and and the the art assets that were repurposed for that in um, Crash and yeah. Um, the only other baddie um, one one can arguably like again this is more of an obstacle like the boulder um, and gravity. Gravity is a big time obstacle in this game. <laughs> it, <laughs> gravity it, is an obstacle. Our <laughs> mavity. Yeah, yeah. If you've seen the most recent Doctor Who. Yeah. It's uh the coconut tree from level five. And and similar to driving off course in DK's Jungle Parkway, you you roll into this coconut tree and a damn coconut will fall on your barrel, the the RCB, and damage it. So you don't want to roll into the coconut tree. You don't want to do it. Yeah, I will say that one of the reasons that I think that, that as I said earlier, this game doesn't seem to break too far from the established Donkey Kong Country aesthetic is because whether it was, and let's, let's be real. Most of the assets in this game probably are from pre-existing art assets. Um, but nonetheless, the ones that they chose for it, the textures that they chose for it, and, and especially these coconut trees, they have that same sort of rare era DKC rendered aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking like it, that. It, it, it works quite well. There, There's that kind of plasticky, kind of rounded look to the palm trees, right. to, to this coconut tree in particular, that I, I really do have such a deep fondness for that realistic but artificial due to its time look right of those trees and you know i'm, I'm fine with the look they, of the they retro- don't look realistic but they look like 1994's best shot at being realistic exactly and i'm fine with the way the the trees of the jungle look in retros games and how they're looking going mm-hmm. forward but this will always be the sweet spot for me just because it hits that nostalgia center of my brain i'm like oh yeah that's the stuff right there <laughs> that's what i want a video game tree to look like because, yeah, I've talked about this in my videos before, that this really was, I mean, obviously we're talking about 2003 here, yeah. the Game Boy Advance sort of uh, sort of extended this a little bit, but there really was this very small window of time in the late 4th, 5th, and I would say early, very, very early 6th gens, where this sort of pre-rendered look was in vogue. Like, video games before that point couldn't have looked like that. And video games after that point were too good at rendering an engine to look like this. So yeah, this is just a uh, so so representative of such a very specific time in the history of gaming. And because this was used to promote the remake of the original Donkey Kong Country, it kind of fits. Of course, yeah. It ki- kind of works as this last gasp of the plasticky palm trees. So yeah. I I don't know, like I I I really do like the look of this game. Even the like squared off like platforms and stuff that would normally put me off. I think because of the textures they used on the sides of it, it's like if you squint, it it it, it reads like this, this, you could encounter this in nature, maybe. I don't know. Uh you have to really you, you can encounter extremely rectangular natural terrain i don't i don't know that's why this section of the congo jungle is so dangerous josh that's why you have to be airlifted mm. in and out because there's just no way to navigate safely this extremely squared off rectangular terrain 
And that's why they're using the remote control barrel. It's it's for their own safety. But it's so lousy with bananas because the soil, the rectangular soil, is so rich with nutrients. The rectangles <laughs> just feed the banana trees so much. Uh. And that's why the bananas are laying on the ground in, di- in like these ridiculously gigantic bunches. They have fallen off of the trees, which we mostly do not see. Uh, that, that that cover the canopy. That's right. That's right. Exactly. You okay. you got it. And speaking of the banana bun, the banana bunches. Let's talk or recap really quickly what the collectibles in this game are and exactly what they do for you. Because the banana bunches, we're we're factoring those in as the main drivers of the plot. Mm-hmm. However, you can get through this entire game without collecting banana bunches just fine. And Donkey Kong will just have the banana bunches at the end of the level. Uh, I always try to collect the banana bunches because, to me, that always serviced the plot more than the other things. But the banana bunches also restore the damage meter on the RCB. So if you do take damage, the banana bunches will replenish that banana meter. And, right. um, you know, I, I guess the RCB is powered by bananas, like a lot of things on Donkey Kong Island. So I, yeah, I guess that, that would seem to make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it I, I do always love that retroactive continuity, haha, retroactive from the Retro Studios games that establishes that the bananas have magical properties. They have there, there, there's all there's all this like sort of indirectly communicated lore and history with them, and that's it, it's not just a matter of K rule wanting the bananas, but to for for the, for the sake of them being bananas. Yeah, yeah. There there's like alchemy that can be done with bananas as shown by the Tiki Tech tribe. Uh yeah, so uh the the bananas also get you 250 points, which who cares. Um <laughs> there there are also two types of treasure that one can find, silver barrels which can get you 1000 points. And the gold barrel, uh, which which is the the pinnacle of treasure in this game, gold barrels net you two thousand points. And so, my best, do, my best, do you have any idea what the silver and gold barrels might represent in lore? Because this this is more your purview. Absolutely, Josh. I'm glad you said that. The I silver, am not surprised. The silver and gold barrels, in my best estimation, are probably ancient Tiki Tak tribe artifacts. Because we know that the golden bananas, which were first seen in Mario Party, but were then explored more fully in Donkey Kong 64, we ultimately learned that there was a prime golden banana that could warp you to Tiki Tong's home dimension. It was housed in the Golden Temple, and... All the smaller golden bananas that comprise Donkey Kong's golden banana hoard seen in Donkey Kong 64, which he discovered in Mario Party, those were made in homage to the prime golden banana, this um, gateway, if you will, to this dimension where this ancient god originated that the Kongs uh, worshipped at one point, took their name from, derived Kong from Tong, and of course, mm-hmm. then things went south with them. But anyway, uh, so so I think that this is just another Tiki Tech tribe artifact. So much of Kong culture and society is derived from the early Tiki Tech tribe, including their affinity for barrels. Right uh, when the Tiki Tech right. tribe returned, um, they they housed their spirits in barrels and bongos and what have you. So it makes sense that there would be these. Um, golden and silver reliefs of barrels and um they they would just still be found throughout the jungle and yeah i'm sure donko's going to collect them maybe he's there for the bananas but if he can nab a little bit of treasure along the way well hey that's a bonus yeah and and also this could be the earliest signs that the kongs and therefore the audience would have had of the tiki tac tribe retroactively we can see this as a hint toward their existence 
and what was coming in 2010. Yeah, I, I would say the Golden Bananas from 1999, the right. Silver and Gold Barrels from 2003, and of course, the DK Bongos, which debuted in 2004, which my theory there is that the DK Bongos, which washed up on the beach of DK Island, they were an ancient Tiki Tac tribe device. And by utilizing the DK Bongos in Donkey Konga and Donkey Konga 2, Donkey Konga 3 if you're in Japan, and Donkey Kong's final smash in, in Brawl, uh, that actually had the effect of waking up the Tiki Tac tribe in the dormant volcano in Donkey Kong Island. And they eventually gained enough power and resurrected in 2010. So see all the signs were there. That's the thing that's kind of frustrating to look back on this because the buyout era, we were, there was so much hand wringing. There was so much teeth gnashing. There was so much, uh, consternation over the future of Donkey Kong. But if we could have just put like all the signs were there and if somebody had just been able to thread that needle and put it all together, we would have known. We would have known that we, that everything was going to be okay. Everything was going to work out. It was a masterful 11 year plan. It was. Yeah. It truly was. <laughs> the, okay. The, the Hourglass, which adds 30 seconds of additional power to the RCB, and therefore your overall time for a level, these are essential to get in the later levels. You have to immediately seek out the Hourglasses. Uh, they also get you 250 points, but who cares? I don't know. Th- this is a weird collectible because, like, an hourglass is is such an atypical Donkey Kong collectible. Like, silver and gold barrels, banana bunches, sure. Sure. Bloons with characters' faces on them? <laughs> Our- hourglasses, though, like, I-, I-, I would accept an anthropomorphic stopwatch, right? Sure. Um, and and <laughs> s- the stopwatches that you got from the sheepy shop in Donkey Kong Land 3, but an hourglass, I don't know, Josh. Um, I, I assume this is also an ancient Tiki Tac tribe device. They used hourglasses. I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> I like how you, you, you will go to great lengths to explain the silver and gold barrels. You, but, but the hourglasses, you're just like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a video game. It's, Even you know, I have it, my limits. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I could talk for hours about the silver and gold barrels and explain to you exactly why they would have made them. But then, you know, we get to the hourglass and I've just lost patience. Because, yeah, you're right, because we said earlier the banana, the bananas seem to protect the RCV, okay? Yeah. We, we said earlier that it, that, it, that the, the RCV ran on the power of the bananas, but in fact, it, it does just restore their damage meter. Uh, you theorized earlier in the episode that the timer represents the battery power of the RCV, and the hourglasses restore that power. So the, the RCV appears to have two different functions, one protective with the bananas, one battery powered or whatever it's running on, the hourglasses restore it. I guess it's running on sand. I don't know. It's running on sand. There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe this is another thing that we should earmark for the follow up episode where we figure out if Donkey or Diddy Kong was in fact controlling the RCB in each level. We, we need some sort of inanimate object version of the character witness where we can really mm-hmm. get into the mechanics like the blueprints of the rcb and really like crack open how it works and that episode will begin at three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> just because i could think of no better way to greet the rising sun than wrapping up <laughs> the I, I don't know, the, the, the blueprint, the Funkies Workshop, colon, RCB episode of the conversation. So, sure. we are not, I am sorry to say, going go through each and every level of this game and tell you exactly how it's laid out. The most we were going to do is tell you which baddies, which obstacles appear in each one. Because, quite frankly... I don't think we can really do this justice. Well, not not that we can't do it justice. I don't think there's enough interesting discussion to be had recapping each and every level. It's kind of the, one of those things where you just have to see it for yourself 
to properly understand it. A 2D side-scrolling game, a 3D platforming game, yes, I can talk to you in depth about every level, about every world, in, in a, in a weird isometric obstacle course shockwave game. Audio alone. Audio alone cannot capture or communicate the brilliance and the depth of the level design in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. You're just going to have to find a way to play it yourself. I was going to use the term majesty. Majesty. That's good, yeah. too. Yeah. So we, we're not going to talk about that, but I do want to talk a little bit about how this game, coupled with Mario Kart Double Dash, really did break me in 2003. <laughs> you know, because up until that All point, right. Up until that point, I had made it a habit, a religion, if you will, here at Midnight Mass, talking the Donkey Kong universe, I would beat every DKU game, 100% complete it, you know, from beginning to end, as they came out, as they were relatively new. Sometimes it would take me a couple months, you know, because I, I would also... Sometimes you needed time travel, but you did do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I would savor it, you know. I, I would mm -hmm. um make the most of it, but it would still be within that window of when the game was new. And right. it was Double Dash that really... I, I just couldn't... I, I just couldn't at the time. It really did, like, ruin me. And, and I tried to play Barrel Maze, and maybe because my heart wasn't in it because of what happened with Double Dash. And I was like, I can't move on to Barrel Maze. I haven't beat Double Dash. But right. also, this game was brutally difficult, and it was extremely sensitive, in in a very unrefined way that I wasn't accustomed to. Because I, I was used to the polish of Rare and Nintendo. And, and so to be in this unseemly terrain of shockwave games on lifesaver websites uh i i, I just which couldn't is an accurate it. depiction which is an accurate description of how it feels to play double dash but we're, we're, we're we've moved on to talking about barrel maze again <laughs> so like really like where my greatest concern was is i don't want this game to go away i don't want it to disappear before i have a chance to properly sit down and defeat it and once we preserved it once once we knew it was going to be safe for the future uh i i basically just put it out of my mind and when i went back and i decided you know i'm reinvested in dk vine i'm reinvested in the donkey kong universe i want to experience all these games that i missed over the last seven years or so uh donkey kong country barrel mates was one of the first i got back to after i beat Double Dash, and, and what an event that was for me. What what a what a sweaty mess I was. I went back to Barrel Maze. I um just to show you how quaint I was. I had burned it on a CDR and uh like pulled it up, and I was like, "All right, Barrel Maze, let's do it." And I chron chronicled this on the DK Vine forum back then as part of the Slush Fund. And it took me a couple of days, but it didn't take me long at all. I was surprised at how quickly I got through it in 2010. And I think it's because, one, my heart was in it this time around. And two, as I said, it kind of paled compared to Double Dash. And defeating like the all-cup mode with Donkey and Diddy and the DK Jumbo. So this was just flicking an arrow key on my keyboard until I was well acquainted with each level enough that I could do it. And I have to say, like, ordinarily this would have pissed me off how cheap the ending to this was. I can't think of a worse ending than a DKU except for Donkey Kong Land. Because Donkey Kong Land, of course, the, the ending to that game is you you just get a message that says congratulations and then the end credits yeah, if roll. i remember right isn't it just congratulations period like you don't it's not even an exclamation point it's not even worthy of the excitement 
of an exclamation right. point. It just congratulations. <laughs> and then the credits roll. And then the credits roll. And that was okay because Donkey Kong Land, at the very least, was a whirlwind journey through Donkey Kong lore. I talk about the lore of Barrel Maze, but Donkey Kong Land gave us Kremlantis, Josh. It gave us Chimpanzee Clouds. It gave us Big Ape City and Hogwash and Nemo. I mean, Don- Donkey Kong Land, I will defend to the end. I know Donkey Kong Land is flawed, but what a flawed experience. But Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, like, th- this has almost as poor an ending where you just get the the same as the title screen, except it now says, congratulations, this time with an exclamation mark. It says, congratulations, you finished all the levels. Yeah, it's also the same as the level, as each level result screen with Donkey Kong sort of appearing to stand on top of the HUD. Yeah. While Cranky and Diddy are doing their mo- their motion tweening flash animations uh on either side of the logo. Yeah, yeah. So so it's uh Congratulations, you finished all the levels. Oh, it is an exclamation point this time though, as you said. All right. The, let, let, the, you finished all the levels doesn't appear to have any punctuation though, so I I don't know how to take that one. Okay, let, let me let me let me try that again. I have to get it accurate, Josh, all right? Right. Congratulations. You finished all the levels? Now that's a question mark. Huh? Congratulations! You finished all the levels. Yeah, yeah, it's just cut off because there's no punctuation at all. So it, you think they're gonna say more, and then it just never comes. Congratulations! You finished all the levels. Now each word of "you finished all the levels" is capitalized. I notice, uh, suggesting that they are all in some way a proper noun. So you, of course, that's the beginning of the sentence, though finished. Um, I, I guess in, in terms of finishing a video game, maybe that makes sense. And then all the levels, I would say that's that perhaps that's the name of the, of the world in Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze is the all the levels region of, of DK Island. All the levels. <laughs> Sorry. Let me, let me try this one more time. Congratulations. You finished all the levels. That's as good as I can get. You sound, you sound like one of those like 1970s uh, speech-to-text devices. For all we know, that's what they used to make this game. So, <laughs> th- th- this would have pissed me off. Like, not even a, like uh, a unique in-game animation of like Donkey Kong's model or anything. But my hands were so sweaty that I would say... Coming off of the dual victory of defeating Double Dash and finally defeating Barrel Maze, these two basically hippos on my back, you know? Uh, the games that had broken you seven years earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the glistening hippos on my back. I finally got them off my back. And <laughs> this was so glorious. Such, such a victory for me. Two victories in such a short time that... This ending was almost as beautiful as Donkey Kong Country 2's was. Like, I, I would put this in my top 20 endings in video games just because of what this represented for me. Finally putting old demons to rest. So, And I, I, I appreciate you saying that as somebody who is typically very gameplay driven myself. I know what you mean by that. The... It doesn't really matter so much what the ending is, per se. What matters is how difficult was it to get there. Yeah. And and that's that's what makes for the most memorable endings to me. So yeah. I know exactly what you mean by even this, because of because of what it meant to you, because of how long it took, because of the struggle and strife that you went through to achieve it, even this can hit you. The, the in a in a not dissimilar way to that iconic scene at the end of Donkey Kong Country 2. 
But still, like, he, he could have brought the bananas back to his banana horde and done his little victory thing there. Like, that would have been apropos. Like, they could have just... Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Josh. They, they, they did not expect anyone to ever actually beat this. Yeah. I mean, I, I somebody else beat this out there besides me. So... I, I will go back and give it a shot after this episode. That's that, I, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I know somebody else has at least beaten it because Mario Wiki has an article about it. And uh, they seem to know what they're talking about. So I, I'm going to trust at least two people in this world have eaten Barrel Maze. Now, implausibly, we have some calls, Josh, about Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. Just a reminder, if you would like to call... Wait, the 37 con- calls? What the hell? <laughs> it's actually going to be Gary Kitchen and David Crane calling in. Um <laughs> No, we have we have two calls. Maybe it's Gary Kitchen and David Crane. Uh, but if you would like to call the conversation, you can give us a call at any time via the DK Vine hotline. That's one two zero two six three zero Vine eight four six three. Call. You know, we we announce an episode usually usually a day before, sometimes two days before, sometimes the day of, but. We, we like, this is the topic at hand, right? And uh, we're, we're soliciting calls, and you can call in then and give us your thoughts. Uh, you, but it's also open all the time. You can call in whenever you want. We can't promise we'll get to your thoughts uh, if they're not relevant to the topic at hand. But, you know, we, we sometimes pull them out for the call sack. And so feel free. The line's always open. You don't have to talk to anybody. I'm not going to pick up and go boo and scare you. I have that option. I'm not but going to exercise it, but I, yeah, I could, but I'm not going to, so don't worry. Josh, should we go ahead and play this first call? Yeah, but I will say real quick, one thing that I, that I've seen people kind of fret about a little bit and that I, that I'd like to reassure potential callers to the DK Vine hotline is that if you call in and you feel like you didn't have, like, you know, I know talking off the cuff. Uh, can can be difficult and be and be a bit scary, especially when you are just. I mean, I've called the hotline myself before. Um, if you call in and then you des- decide that you don't that you you didn't really depict what you wanted to say as well, and you call back and say and give it a second shot, Heil will not play your original call. Heil, <laughs> no, we 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 are not going to make fun of our listeners. No, no, this isn't gotcha podcasting here i'm not right. i'm not looking to humiliate people um like i said like like i said in the last episode i'm all about spreading uh the good vibes if i can and uh i'm all Listen, about I, I know lots of people have a fear of of speaking on the phone josh i hate it i i cannot leave mm-hmm. a message because i ramble and 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 i i can't get to my point if i don't have somebody to talk to on the other end and it's just the right. most impersonal, cold feeling in the world. So if you would like to feel that, please call the DK Vine hotline at one two zero two six three zero vine All right, let's go ahead and play that first call. Hello, Josh. Hello, Heil. This is Carl Nax. I am I'm so glad, I'm so privileged to be calling into this, uh, to this midnight mass to, uh, to celebrate the object of our faith, Donkey Kong Barrel Maze, released in 2003 for all good PC platforms. You see, Barrel Maze, it serves such a, uh, it serves the role of the savior in our lives. Uh, released in 2003, just, just mere months after the buyout of Rare by Microsoft in September of 2002, the, the dark time was an uncertain time. Uh, we felt more disconnected from our spiritual experience with Donkey Kong than ever before. But Barrel Maze, Barrel Maze, came to deliver us. It gave us the security of knowing what Donkey Kong is all about. It's about barrels. It's about collecting bananas. And it's about seeing PNGs of our favorite Donkey Kong characters when we clear the level. And this salvation that came to us in an unexpected guise. And Skyworks Interactive, an unknown video game publisher, they make mobile games. They make games for handhelds. Or at least they did. But, you know, all great religious teachers, they came from humble origins. They were not expected to change the very world. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, brother, only a humble carpenter, 
uh, Muhammad, who was only a trader within the Arabian Peninsula, Buddha was a was a prince sheltered from the world until they made uh, until they made their mark on the world. And Skyworks, Skyworks Technologies, Skyworks Interactive, they they made their mark with Barrel Maze. Praise be. Thank you again for this opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you for just making sure you you checked as many sacrilegious boxes as you could. For, for your call. I um I appreciate that we Sacri- no, I, I liked that he brought a more fundamentalist bend yes. to the to the, to this midnight mass. <laughs> I I don't I don't know what sac- he was making it more religious in my opinion. It's the first time I'm sure Gary Kitchen and David Crane have ever been compared to Buddha. <laughs> so they they should feel good about about Deservedly so though. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think. I don't think Boardwalk Baltos would have elicited that response. But the fact that they made a Donkey Kong game gives them that. Um, gives them that pedestal to be hoisted upon. Thank you for the call. Uh, let Let's uh, go ahead and take the, uh, the the next call before the boycotts for this episode and the conversation and the geek critique fully begin. Hey, DK Vine, it's Poor Young Q here, calling in about the episode for Donkey Kong Country Barrel Blast, or Barrel Maze, perhaps messed that up. Anyway, I think this game is pretty cool. Um, I personally haven't played it, and I intend to eventually. I'm way too busy right now. But one thing I do kind of want to talk about is the form that it's in, like the type of game that it is, specifically that it's like a quick, easy flash game. Not quick and easy, but it's a flash game you play on your computer. And I know that may seem like a weird thing to point out, but I think that's a type of game that in many ways is sort of not given the respect it deserves. Maybe this is just because I grew up in the 2000s and 2010s when we all had laptops in school and we spent all our free time playing cool math games. But those sorts of games like have a lot of players. Like that's a specific type of game that's with low budget, low value, not low value, but like low priority type of game. It has such a unique feel to it. It's just such a cool vibe and sort of energy that a flash game like that has. Like the sort of thing you see on Newground, and it's like the Shockwave, but the sort of thing you see on like Cool Math Games, you know, like a Run 2 or like a Blue Power Defense sort of game. It's just such a specific energy that it feels like it's almost gone from the industry anymore. And it's such a shame. And like, I know Barrel Maze is not, like, the biggest game of all time. It's not like it's the most grandiose Donkey Kong game ever made. It maybe is the most grandiose Donkey Kong game ever made. But I still think this is a really cool game. I'm so happy that DKU has a game like it, a game of that sort of feeling, of that sort of, sort of flavor. It just really shows how big and diverse the DKU really is. Well, thank you for the call, Porygon Q. I was like, oh my god, somebody who played Barrel Maze. And then they said they didn't play Barrel Maze. They, so. they, they, they didn't have time. <laughs> uh, Porygon Q, who was in the chat at the beginning of this episode, but uh, has has likely fallen asleep by now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, some people have to sleep so they can't play Barrel Maze. Other people have to stay up all night to podcast about right. Barrel Maze. Sure. Uh, I'm also glad you were the first. Kyle, did you know that Porygon is, in fact, a Pokemon? You're blowing my mind. Actually, I did know that. So, uh, <laughs> I figured. Yeah. I, I am also glad that Porygon was the first to make the malapropism of calling this game um, barrel blast because I was afraid I was going to be doing that relentlessly throughout this episode and thus far have avoided making that mistake J- just because of course Donkey Kong barrel blast is the more well-known Donkey Kong game quality maybe on par with <laughs> barrel maze no um, maybe <laughs> Um, I, I, I was going to say it helps if you use its full Christian title, Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, because, of course, Barrel Blast is just Donkey Kong Barrel Blast. Yes. By yes. including the country in there, it's it's easier to keep them straight. It's funny how so many people forget about the country in these games. Like, a, a lot of people outside the fandom will call Donkey Kong Country 2 Donkey Kong 2 
or Donkey Kong Country 3 Donkey Kong really? 3. Yeah, they'll they'll just gloss over that. Hmm. I know, like, it's super Donkey Kong in, in Japan and, and what have you, but it just, I don't know. I, I feel like, for me, Donkey Kong Country is such an important part of the branding that whenever it's included, I can't help but use it, so. Well, also because if somebody said Donkey Kong 2, my mind would go to Donkey Kong Jr. The yeah. The game, not the character. Right, right, right. Because that was followed by Donkey Kong 3, starring Stanley the Bugman. Starring, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, I, I agree, Porygon. Like, I, I'm glad this exists. It It is, like, um a snapshot in time, a very particular time. But it it is something that I think makes the DKU more interesting, makes the Donkey Kong series vastly more interesting just by existing. Like, we can debate its actual quality all the live long day or, or very late night or very early morning. But sure. like, there's no question in my mind, like I'm happy this exists. Oh yeah. Me too. For sure. I, like I was saying at the top of the episode, it's and in line with what Porygon was saying. It's very, it's, it's neat that the DKU and the Donkey Kong, the Donkey Kong brand in general would get, a game that is such a snapshot of a very particular era of gaming history and internet history, because you would not even even though you know as 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 we've been saying and as Freezer says in the chat, mobile games sort of filled this a similar role until they discovered microtransactions and then they went all in on that. The next Donkey Kong Country game or the next Donkey Kong game, whatever form it takes, I do not expect will get any sort of like a side game mobile tie-in yeah. like this. This only could have happened between the years of about really 2000 to I would say 2005. Even any point after that and it and it would have been a a little long in the tooth for a for a shockwave tie-in game uh to come out. Josh, I have to ask, did Sonic ever have something comparable? Oh god, I don't even know. <laughs> what? I go to so- you. Sonic had so Look, not even I can encapsulate the entire history of uh, of Sonic. Sonic had J- Japan only mobile only games that only worked with specific phones. There were things called like Sonic Golf that ca- that came out for mobile devices in Japan only. Um, probably the most well-known Sonic-related thing that comes to mind, though, is, was, was not actually anything official. There was a Flash game called Ultimate Flash Sonic, which, um, is actually of a very similar era and a very similar vintage of Barrel Maze. It was based primarily using the sprite work of the Sonic Advance games, and it was pretty good and pretty competent for for a fan-made flash game of the time um i remember playing it for probably about five minutes and being like oh well that's pretty cool and then like 10 years later you saw this horde of people for whom this was the first sonic game they ever played uh alas donkey kong country barrel maze has not had a similar nostalgia bomb no until now until now yeah i mean we here we are yeah we're we're (laughs) We're we're lighting the fuse. <laughs> you know, I, I I do make fun of this game a little bit, but it's always good natured. Like I make fun of it because I feel like I can because I I'm part of the family that also right. cherishes this game. Um, I I I don't want anybody else outside the fandom making fun of it. Don't you dare! Nobody else outside of the fandom knows that it exists. They're they're not going to. You you don't have anything to worry about. They they don't know it exists, and I adore that it exists. So mm-hmm. there you go. Like I have a soft spot for any game that exists in the periphery of a franchise, like on the bubble of basically not even existing at all. You know, a, a secret that's only known or remembered by the utmost faithful. Like that's that's the kind of stuff that really gets my juices flowing, just like the juices on the back of those hippos. And 
you know, the, the mobile games of today can come and go, you know, that they can, they can appear and then they can be delisted and then maybe gone forever. And you, you got those like 99 games, like blank 99, like on the switch right. that can be really popular. And then they're, they make a big splash and then Nintendo's just like, well, it's gone. And, and then the pour game, one out from pour one out for Mario 35. And then we have something like Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze, which is a game that's been preserved by us. We did it. Uh, and, and as far as those web browser games go, I would say, like, this is one of the more polished ones of this era. Um, and, and whether or not the assets are original or not, we can debate. But at the very least, it looks fresh if you'll allow the parlance for Donkey Kong. It, it looks like it's a new Donkey Kong experience um, with, with a few reused renders here or there. You know, Barrel Maze has often been a game debated in our fandom over whether or not it should actually count as a game. Like, why do we venerate this with an official canonical or phenonical, if you will, status, and not all of those Flash-based games that appeared on the official game websites or Nintendo.com. Like, what puts Barrel Maze above those? And, you know, part of the initial reason was that, yeah, it, it felt like a fully fleshed out real game on a platform with, I, I guess, a bit more respectability like CandyStand.com. I realize that's a laugh, but bear with me here. <laughs> candy. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I always say a game's not really a game if it's not on CandyStand.com. <laughs> You know, because because a lot of those flash games on on Nintendo dot com or on the uh, respective websites for the games, they were just you know renders getting shifted around the screen. You had some innate mouse clicking, but there wasn't a whole lot to them. And Barrel Maze felt like an actual fleshed out game. So you're saying there's like a specificity to it. Yes, yes. And, and and maybe this is like getting deep in the weeds and and this is a philosophical debate for another day. Like, yes, maybe we need to have another conversation about whether other games of this ilk like Lunchables, Banjo Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, Aerial Challenge, uh, should should count as an actual DKU game. Like why does Barrel Maze rank when Lunchables, Banjo Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, Aerial Challenge does not? Uh, <laughs> I, I'll I'll say this: there are worse games published for the Game Boy Advance than Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. That's right. So if if you if you want to judge the quote unquote real game authenticity of it based on that, there. Th- I, I've played worse. I've played so much worse. Yeah, and whether or not you view any intrinsic value in the gameplay of Barrel Maze, whether or not you think you know, we're, we're favoring this game over the likes of Lunchables, Banjo-Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, Aerial Challenge, that shouldn't diminish Barrel Maze's unique, charming place in the history of Donkey Kong. And... I would argue its role in the canon of the Donkey Kong universe. It, it's it's a wholly unique thing, and it is set apart from all these other Flash-based games, and that's why we're sitting here 20 years later talking about it. And yeah, we might be the only ones. You know, that's okay. That's <laughs> that's our purpose. That's DK Vine's purpose is is to revel in the obscure, in the arcane. You know, to to dust things off and show people, hey, this existed. Hey, there's this connection. No, I was, I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled when you pulled me for this episode specifically because it's like, <laughs> if we don't, who will? I have to be honest, Josh. I uh, I asked around the staff, the DK Vine staff, and and nobody was really interested. And <laughs> you and I have a lot of the same wiring in our brains where we. Are, are just 
fascinated by games and game series and, and pop culture in the broader sense. But but even if we can't like actually connect with a property, just the very existence of something can really get our brain turning over and get us excited mm-hmm. just like putting ourselves in the shoes of a fan of something or imagining how we would react to something existing in our wheelhouse. And so, so just your love of weirdness like this, I was like, you know, this would be a good, good pull for Josh. Like I had Josh earmarked for another episode that I'd like been kicking around for maybe late in the conversation season. And I was like, Mm-hmm. Actually, Josh on the spotlight episode for Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze would be a good use of his talents. And we can kick that episode to season 12, like the, the other episode sure. I had planned for him. So uh, thank you for being here and thank you for doing it. You know, th- this came up earlier. Like, could you do Barrel Maze today? It, like in a more polished format, of course, but like... I, I think you could. I think this would be a fun little concept for a game if you revived it for the mobile platform or, you know, I don't know, maybe even a mini game kind of thing in, in a larger Donkey Kong game. Like, sure, polish up the controls. Mm-hmm. Please polish up the controls. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think maybe if you, if you could actually control it with... Uh, control stick or a d-pad or you had a little bit more kinetic level design i i think it would be a fun experience like this is one of those things like it's mr pants where i look back and i'm like this could work even today with just a little bit of refinement a little bit of retooling and a little bit of recontextualization of the platform it's on and um well the word little bit is doing a lot of work there okay but i'm a dreamer I, I, I can sure. imagine. No, I'm not, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm saying it would take more than a little bit, but it could, but I, I do agree it could work. Obviously, Skyworks is seemingly defunct. And I, I very much doubt Nintendo themselves would say, hey, you remember Doggo Country Barrel Maze? But I don't know, something <laughs> like it would, would, would work. And, you know, it, it probably will never happen. And that's fine. That's fine because we, at least we have this. At least we have this, Josh. Like Porygon's point in their call, it's it's kind of remarkable we had this at all because I always look back at things that were very much of their time and I lament that we didn't get a DKU entry for it. And, and I might be the only one in some of these situations because to the layperson... It's probably a good thing that we never got a DKU Tiger Electronics handheld. You you know you 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 bring that up. That is bizarre that we didn't given the timing. Well, those things were everywhere and would continue to be everywhere for quite some time. They were, but I also think Nintendo was a lot more protective. I mean, Nintendo had their own version with the Game and Watch. Like true, true, a- and um, then they had the Game Boy and saw no need for the Game and Watch. But you know the the Tiger Electronic LCD handhelds, very cheap, very tacky. Uh, the closest we got to a DKU equivalent was the Battle Totes tie-in they did. Um, this was, of course, predating the DKU, uh, predating Battle Totes twenty twenty. All all the variants integration of the Battle Totes in rare shared universe um, post 1994. But yeah, we never got a Donkey Kong Tiger Electronics game. Uh, and we never got anything DKU wise considering rare's relationship with Nintendo while these things were still fairly lucrative. Yeah. I, be- I believe the, if I remember right, the last game and watch, I think came out in 1991. So yeah, DKC would have, would have just missed the boat by a few years on those. Yeah, and and by the time Rare was under the auspices of Microsoft, these things were these things even still being made. I don't even know. The latest I can, the latest I remember Tiger Electronics being made was like ninety nine, two thousand. I yeah. know 
for example, Sonic Adventure, which came out in the U.S. in 1999, it got a like that. I, I believe that's the last Sonic game that got a Tiger Electronics related sort of art, sort of game. I'm I'm waiting on the Let's Play of you playing that, Josh. They're so rare and expensive. So it's like this little it's like this little arcade cabinet, and it's actually quite a bit more involved. Then I'm not saying it's good, but it's quite a bit more involved than your standard sort of, you know, two double A batteries, uh, Tiger Electronics LCD handheld game. But no, those ca- th- those things are extremely, extremely hard to come by. <laughs> Would love to play one, though. But yeah, I, I look back at, at those things and I, I saw the Sonic ones, you know, back in the day and I, mm-hmm. I just imagined... What if a Donkey Kong Country game came out as a Tiger Electronics LCD handheld? And, like, I wouldn't enjoy that, but I kind of would enjoy <laughs> no. that. I, I kind of would enjoy that. Like, I, I, I would definitely make a meal out of that. And sure, just like to the average person on the street, it's a good thing that we never got the Donkey Kong game for the Virtual Boy. You know, uh, Paul Makachek, uh, Rare employee to this day, but um, w- one of the driving forces behind a lot of Rare's handheld output, the architect of Stop and Swap as well, um, was behind Donkey Kong Land and was fussing about with a Donkey Kong demo on the Virtual Boy at Rare, but it never came to an actual game because the Virtual Boy quickly collapsed. But Very quickly. I look at the Virtual Boy and I'm like, I I hate that there's not a Donkey Kong Country game on there or a Donkey Kong Land game on there. I would love that. And I, granted, I'm one of the few who like actually adores the Virtual Boy. You're not alone. <laughs> I know. I I I wasn't excluding you. I I was just saying that we we are very similar in a lot of ways, Josh. And um, mm-hmm. but but I look at stuff like that. And the Tiger Electronics thing. And I'm like, I could have had a lot of fun having entries in the DKU there. Like, think of all the lore I I could squeeze out of a Tiger Electronics Donkey Kong game. Like, arguing about how these janky LCD animations of the Kongs fit into the grander timeline. Like, look what I've done with Barrel Maze, Josh. I've connected so many dots that Gary Kitchen and David Crane never, never intended to be connected. But I did it. I I know you said that we don't like blowing smoke up our own asses, but I commend us for playing it straight through most of this episode. There were, there have been several times where I kind of broke a little bit about, about the incredulity of it all. But I think playing it straight was the right way to go here. What do you mean? I'm deadly serious about this, Josh. (laughs) I live and breathe the Donkey Kong universe. And I am proud to stand by Donkey Kong Country Barrel Maze. The Mm -hmm. browser game on CandyStand.com, now owned by Publishers Clearinghouse... That was a legitimate entry in the DKU and a vital piece to understanding the history of Donkey Kong Island and the Congo jungle. Well, Heil, I gotta say, I never had to knock on wood, but I know someone who has. Is that a ska reference? This has been a File 2 production. Perico. Congratulations! You finished all the podcasts! <laughs>